Welcome to Podshots. In this episode, we're going to talk to a man named Andrew Weiss. Andrew is a public speaking champion and sales coach from Portland, Oregon. At 22 years old, he was voted the top public speaker in all of Central and Southern Oregon, having given over a thousand presentations in just three years. He helps people and businesses rapidly multiply the kinds of returns they're seeing by focusing on strategies that have served him and his clients well. Andrew is also childhood friends with Brandon. And in this episode, I was fortunately not made to feel like a third wheel on a date, unlike in episode 17 with It's Tiger. Thanks, guys. Please do rate and review our work. We appreciate all of your feedback and support. Now let's jump right into this wisdom-filled episode with Andrew Weiss. How, how have you been getting through 2020 though, like with your business, like how have you kind of like shifted to like deal with that? Cause I know that you do a lot of like in-person engagements with people with all the you know public speaking help you do. And um, I don't think it affects like your 30 day programs or anything like that, but I'm sure that you've had to adjust a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of my background. Yeah. I, I essentially gave over a thousand presentations over three years, uh, teaching high school students about entrepreneurship, professional skills. Um, and I decided that, uh, I wanted to be compensated more for my work. So I left the nonprofit. Um, and then I, in October, 2019, I decided I want to be my own public speaking and sales coach. Um, and so I would help people book in-person gigs. And then once Corona hit, I'm like, well, dang, I guess I need to help people book virtual gigs. Um, so I was able to do that. And then my business really took off when I hosted a virtual event in May, I called it uh, fight the fluff. Um, because I'm a big fan of, you know, actionable, tangible advice rather than saying, here's three email tips on how to, um, how to, how to improve your email list. And tip number one is email super important. Tip number two is make sure that email is a big part of your life. And then tip number three is look how great email is rather than giving you actual tangible advice. So I host a own virtual event and that really definitely catapulted my business forward because from there, um, I got hired on with uh, PodFest, a guy named Chris Kermitsos. He brought me on as a project manager consultant to help um, reach a Guinness World Record. We broke a Guinness World Record for world's largest virtual podcasting event within one week and had over 5,000 people registered, over 330 speakers. Um, and that was a, that was a blast. Um, and then I, we also did another event in September. We just did another event two weeks ago called VidFest, so three weeks ago. And yeah, we just had a really amazing time. Can I stop you for a second? People. Yeah. Uh, did you get the the record itself? Did, like, did you pick it up? Oh my God. What is that like? Oh, it's it's an incredible feeling. It's something I wanted to do since I was a kid is break a Guinness World Record. Um, and what people don't think about and realize that, you know, they're actually a business. So they do charge you for the record itself. And then for, for each person that wants to get the piece of paper, it's like $40 to ship it from the UK. Um, so, but it's, it's in my room. It's not, not near me at the moment, but uh, yeah, if I had it near me, I definitely showed on the show, but it's definitely pretty cool saying Andrew Wise, Guinness world record holder kind of thing. <laughs> so if you don't pay for it, it's really? technically, thought- it's technically you haven't actually done it. <laughs> In a way, yes. In a, in a way, if, if you don't pay for it, it's not certified by Guinness. So, gotcha. so, so even if Guinness World Record says, oh, you have to do 100 push-ups in a minute to break a world record and you do it, if you don't actually pay them for that record, they can't certify you, even though you might consciously know, oh, yeah, I'm a world record holder, but there's no like proof <laughs> per se. <laughs> I, I thought that they were like a nonprofit. I didn't know they were an actual company. Oh, yeah. No, they they, they charge a lot. Um, so I think so. I um, hopefully I'm okay saying is I believe they charge us $5,000, um, to break that Guinness world record, um, for 5,000 people. And so yeah, they, they definitely make a lot of money off these world records. And then plus, yeah, $40 per person who actually orders the individual certificate itself. So they're, they're definitely a business. So if you want to start your own question, world record company, there you go. My question to them would be like, how often are people breaking records? Cause yeah, $5,000, if a record isn't breaking very often, is not a lot of money. <laughs> no, if you're if you're breaking if you're breaking ten a day, twenty a day, I mean, okay, that's 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 decent. But you know, it makes you wonder. It, it's true. You could break the same activities record over and over again. So there's 
te- theoretically limitless amount of money to be made from this. Exactly. Well, and there's just so many random records that <laughs> are happening every <laughs> single day too. Uh, like like most eggs uh, cracked by your chin in a minute, or like most straws you can fit in your mouth. Like you can think of just the most limitless random thing. And like, they, they make <laughs> money off of that. You can fit in your mouth. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, oh, how man. do you start your own record? Like it sounds like some of these are really really specific, so people can just get into the damn book. Like I'm mm-hmm. wondering, like if someone is on a committee and is picking, like what the records are that you can actually break, or if someone just submits them. Yeah. So, well, so for us, um, we didn't we didn't necessarily break one that was already existing. We had to set a world record, and they told us, like, hey, in order for you to set this record, you need at least five thousand people. Like, if you don't get five thousand people, you don't break anything. So we're like, oh crap, okay. we got we got set up our numbers. So. Yeah, as far as I know, if you want to come up with your own record, you basically have to go on the website, apply, talk to a rep, and they'd say, oh, I guess if you do this, that would count as a world record kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to, it's, just, it's an application process you have to go through, and depending on how big a deal it is, is how expensive it would be, essentially. Um, and I do follow them on Snapchat, too. Like There's like a Guinness World Record um, video series on Snapchat, so it's cool to see all the world records that are broken that way. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of going online and applying and making it happen. Nice. How did they like monitor that? Like, do they have like a person sit in and watch the whole thing or? Uh, yes. So, so uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, John Wick, but they have adjudicators. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they have a fancy committee of people who like look and verify <laughs> everything and make auditing and adjudicator committee. And so you can't just say, oh yeah, we did it. We swear. Like you have to have like eyewitness accounts, testimonials, like we had to bring in one of the top um, accounting executives or top accountants at one of the biggest accounting, accounting companies in the company in the world. Uh, we brought in like a teacher who's very good at being adamant about checking details. So yeah, on top of their eyewitnesses, you have to bring in your own third party eyewitnesses too. Um, and yeah, they're, they're very strict about how they calculated the record. So what you're saying is if you don't actually break the record and you do anything in the realm of lying or killing a dog, you know, they're coming after you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> They'll definitely come after you. Yes. Or they just, or they won't give you the certificate. And we all know it's uh, got to have it for proof. Yes. <laughs> Pixar didn't happen. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, Andrew, uh, run us through what actually, or why actually, you know, you got so interested in public speaking. Cause I, I think it's not something, you grow up wanting to do necessarily uh, much like the uh, arrangements that, you know, maybe Brandon and I have in our lives as well. So how did you get into uh, public speaking? Well, I actually was super lucky because I came out of the womb giving presentations to large audiences. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it just yeah. uh, just a natural born skill. No. Uh, so what a lot of people don't recognize and realize is that public speaking is actually a learned skill. And it's actually a crazy fact somewhere that a majority of public speakers out there are actually introverts. And so when I heard that, I'm like, like my mind is blown. Um, so my, my journey of public speaking is essentially, you know, I run for student government when I was in middle school. I was in some high school musicals when I was in high school. So I was already kind of used to being on stage. But I didn't actually know how to present very well and, and persuade an audience until I joined Toastmasters. And for those who don't know, Toastmasters is it's an international public speaking organization. Definitely life changing experience. Highly recommend that if anyone wants to get improvement on their communication skills, join Toastmasters. Um, but I, I just discovered when I was in high school, when I was going through a dark time, I didn't feel like and my voice wasn't heard. I didn't feel like people cared about my opinion. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was being respected very well. You know, I decided that, you know, I want to, you know, first empower my own voice. I want to show other people that their voice matters too. And their communication skills are really what determine, you know, how successful they want to create their lives. And even Warren Buffett, um, for, for those who don't know Warren Buffett, I think he's about the fourth or third richest man in the world. You know, he has over three degrees and the only degree that he keeps and puts on his wall that he sees every day is his public speaking training degree from Dale Carnegie. And so to show you how important of a skill that is in business and, and personal life and every aspect of your life, you know, public speaking really is a game changer. Um, and I just decided that I want to empower others with those communication skills too. And so that's how I essentially got into it is, um, you know, deciding I wanted to be better at communicating. So I, I felt my voice was heard so I could help empower other people to make their voice heard. 
and really understand that if you know how to communicate well, the world's your oyster. Mm. I wonder what Toastmasters are doing now. How, are they just all online? Yeah. They, as far as I know, be... it's all Zoom meetings, all online. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's a distinct and an energy you you get from online. I mean, you feel a lot more comfortable, that's for sure. I haven't spoken online to, you know, over a hundred people, for example. So I don't know what that feels like. But I, I I'm pretty confident it's uh it's a different it's a different type of animal. So it's it's unfortunate, like, yeah, but, but what's so, what's so good about Toastmasters? Yeah. So basically what's great is that it's free to join. Uh, so that's, that's always good. Free 99 is always a good price. And if you want to do more advanced aspects of the program, I think it's like, uh, I want to say like $5 a month, which is like super amazing deal. Wow. Um, and when I, when I first did Toastmasters personally, you know, I, I was kind of feeling confident in my public speaking skills. And I went out for the international competition where you kind of rise to the ranks to see if you're worthy on speaking on the international world stage. And my first ever competition, I got second place out of two people. <laughs> 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 and so I'm yeah. like, well, dang, I guess I suck at public speaking. That, that, that's too bad. That's, all. <laughs> that's, 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 that's unfortunate. Um, and then I realized the importance of like, because with Toastmasters, one of the things that they can improve on is teaching people how to be more conversational, more authentic, because a lot of people go through Toastmasters, they feel like they have to only focus on not saying filler words or only focus on doing the right body language movements at the right time. But really that the best public speakers out there, in case you haven't noticed any trends, is people who are conversational on stage. They speak to one, but even if they're speaking to a thousand. And when you take that tone, you take that that, that communication skill it really does apply in an amazing way. And that was essentially my journey is after getting second place out of two people, the next year I learned how to be more conversational, how to be more passionate with my, with my presentations. And then I got voted the first place in all of central and Southern Oregon at 22. And it, I would definitely recommend that if someone is serious about public speaking, you know, get, get into Toastmasters, building your brand, hiring a coach and public speakers, you know, one of my mentors, you know, he, uh, his name is Chris Widener. He got personally mentored by Jim Rohn. He's one of the fathers of personal development. Chris Widener gets paid $20,000 per talk. Wow. And so how nice would it be just to walk into a room or to a virtual zoom room, uh, speak for 30 minutes, maybe an hour, collect your $20,000 check, say peace out and, and call it a day. And, and that's, that's life. That's what Bill Clinton does. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a very lucrative field. That's, that's for sure. It's just a matter of honing down that skill. And of course it takes time. It's a learn, learn skill to develop. Interesting. How, how did they, uh, you know, grade you and rank you guys doing it? Like, did they look for certain aspects or certain areas of growth in your public speaking engagement or did they um, have specific metrics? Like how, how do they determine who gets first place, who gets second place, who gets third place? Yeah. So they have a panel of judges and yeah, I don't know the specific criteria at the top of my head, but I would say you know, they grade you on filler words, on body language, mm -hmm. on how you cultivate your story, on your hook, um, what else do they probably grade you on? I guess how, yeah, how you take advantage, how you move around the stage and do you use props at all? How do you use your props? So there's like a whole sheet of metrics that the judges use. They try and be objective with their, with their judgment, but of course, you know, human nature, we're going to be subjective. So, um, there's all, but there are metrics that they go off of. Yes. Mm. Very nice. Did, did this lead you? naturally into doing things like TEDx? I heard that you did something with TEDx. Well, Brandon and I attended a TEDx event together and that was, that was really fun. We went to TEDx Portland together and that was a blast. And uh, Brandon and I made the finalists for the top piano players in the crowd. So <laughs> that, that, was, that was definitely exciting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was time. an accident. That shouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brent, Brandon showed off his uh, one-handed furly skills. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, yeah. okay. And then we had another. That was the only song I knew. It was like shit, and then they put my name up as a finalist. <laughs> so I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. Then uh, 
yeah, while, while Brandon was playing one handed for Elise, the next person was like an actual music teacher who like blindfolded herself beforehand <laughs> and started playing both hands. Of, of course, she's the one that got selected as the actual winner, <laughs> but, but it's still entertaining to see that contrast. <laughs> did you just um, like not tell anyone, Brandon? You were just like, you were just going to try your hardest to beat this person. Well, they just, they just said, hey, come try out. I thought everyone was going to be as shit as I was. So I just, I knew only one hand of fur at least so i just played that <laughs> just played again I, <laughs> for the second time and then i'm in too deep i can't get out it, it was funny because it was me andrew and then everyone else there's like i don't know five six other people that were like really fucking good so i was like okay i should not be in this room i should not be in this group <laughs> <laughs> hey but you put yourself out there brandon that, that's what matters that's what matters yes, yeah great, yeah, great, great just guy <laughs> Um, but yeah, I definitely do want to speak at a TEDx event someday. That is, that is still something I need to do. Uh, maybe I need to make that a 2021 goal for sure, even though I know it's tricky because it won't be as exciting to do a virtual TEDx event. But, you know, TEDx is TEDx. It's still still very highly sought after speaking opportunity, essentially. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. definitely something I want to do at some point. Yeah. Oh, well. Have you been in contact with anyone from any of the, the TEDx events in any of the cities or are you getting any opportunities to try out to do that like what's that process like i remember them telling us when we were at tedx portland a little bit about how you could uh, sign up to you know at least get looked at to do it um but i wasn't sure if there was like a whole other process to it yeah so there's a process to each tedx event is that they have a committee and then they accept applications you have to apply and um that they're really adamant about making sure that you're not giving like a keynote speech you're you're giving you're talking about a specific topic about something as tangible that helps people one idea um but yeah each there are yeah essentially you go to like tedx.com and look up um, all the upcoming events and all the places you can apply to and yeah it does require building relationships with people to see if they'll bring you on or not and really making sure that that's when you give that that talk that you know what you're doing and a lot of those tedx conferences and events also have tedx coach speaking coaches to help you with your your concept as well and yeah it's just a matter of finding where you want to speak and applying and following the processes to get selected okay cool cool well hopefully you're on stage soon dude would, <laughs> would love to see that at portland yeah yeah i know well tedx portland is actually the biggest tedx event in the country which is pretty wild that uh, TEDx Portland has that kind of fame and yeah, it's, it's definitely exciting that, uh, we're, you know, it's in my own backyard, but it also doesn't mean it's any easier for us to get selected. So sometimes you have to give multiple TEDx event, uh, events to be able to work your way up to like the top ones. And so, yeah, I just got, you got to start somewhere though. The next one's supposed to be at Moda Center, right? Yeah. They wanted to do it at the Moda Center before COVID. Um, but uh, hopefully, well, yeah, we'll be ho hopefully once the vaccines all distributed and uh, things are settled down by the summer, hopefully they'll be able to make it happen eventually. I know I'm excited to go back to the Motor Center to watch the Blazers. You know, I'm a big fan of the <laughs> Portland Trail Blazers, big basketball fan, and so I can't wait to get back to sporting events and live for that excitement. Yeah, well, hopefully they actually win this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm happy they got at least one win versus the Lakers and stole game one. Like, that made me incredibly happy. I'm like, fuck you, yeah. Lakers. <laughs> yeah, beat LA. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's, def it's not exciting. Though. For those who don't follow basketball, the Blazers lost by 30 twice in the preseason, which is not good. <laughs> so, but, about, uh, but every other team win by the same amount of games or lose the same amount of games that the Blazers did. So we technically did just as good as everybody else. Except the Heat. The Heat won two games, but other than the Heat. And uh, we did, yeah, we lost the same amount of games as everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, got, we got that going. And it, what's interesting, uh, I, I learned Brandon is, uh, Clement could speak to this, is that when I was traveling around Spain, no sports teams have mascots. Like, like it's just like Barcelona versus Spain. It's not like the Barcelona do that, Bulls no. versus, versus yeah. the Spanish uh, Tortoise or something. Like, so I thought that was interesting that there was no mascots in sports teams. Yeah, in it's not yeah. a big thing in Europe. Uh, <laughs> but basketball's gotten more and more, and American football too has gotten more popular over time. And mm. you know, you have like the London whatever they call them, right? So they have their mascots and. Uh, and it and it's just associated and linked to American sports, uh, which is a, obviously an interesting culture and is great. I think it's good that way. It, it brings a uniqueness to your sporting world, and we're just very you know basic when it comes to that. Your team, 
your kit and then go out and see who wins. Um, I think there's a lot more entertainment as well. Not that this is a conversation about sports, but I think there's a lot more entertainment value when it comes to American sports as, as opposed to European sports. The end of the game uh, kind of rundown is significantly less interesting and uh, one-dimensional. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a lot more entertaining to watch something like American football, I think. So, so what you're saying... You said there's football in England now? Really? <laughs> yeah oh yeah football you say football i thought you were saying sorry soccer yeah um because uh, yeah. we say football if for soccer i got it That's okay yeah. american football which is a you know the way that we differentiate between yeah yeah yeah, yeah but so, yeah there is there is there is. so clement for for your football soccer you got soccer. You got no mascot, no cheerleaders, no. <laughs> nothing to be yeah, excited I'm laughing. About. You see, because that's a funny <laughs> thought to have cheerleaders at a soccer game. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't match. It's not. Let's like, go, boys! Kick those <laughs> balls. <laughs> Although there is this one really hot referee, uh, and she's. I think she's. She might actually be Colombian, um, Ooh, but no. she. Uh, she's one of a very good reason to tune into football games uh, or or turn up to football, football games. games. Yeah, football, soccer games, soccer games, and uh, and she's got a a good personality. She 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 plays tricks on the players and things like that. So it's it's that kind of thing that kind of makes up for the lack of cheerleaders or <laughs> you got <laughs> referees that play tricks on the players. Okay, wait, what's yeah. what, is, what is she an Instagram influencer or? or no, she's a pro- oh, well, oh, well, yeah, she's probably. Oh man, I mean, look, if you want to become an influencer, like that's a good way to do it. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> being, way to do it. being a ref of football games, <laughs> get a niche and then like kill it. You know, you look great, you're doing something all the men like, and then boom, overnight success. I'm sure. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, hot, There's a lot of refs, female yeah. refs popping up in American football, too. I've noticed that a lot this year, uh, especially in the NFL. It's really interesting. Women are really getting into the sport. Kind of like it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's only fair. It's all, They're eventually pretty good. Gonna happen. They're pretty good. There was <laughs> so actually are they this Instagram girl. Influencers? <laughs> I don't know, but they're going to be. And there's this girl at Vanderbilt who played is the first female to play an American football game, and Ooh. she was the the kicker for Vanderbilt. She kicked. Uh, the PATs and a bunch of field goals. She's super famous right now. She's going to be an influencer. I guarantee it. Well, no, I think she was the first one in that conference. I'm pretty sure there was another female football player before her. Um, well, I think the first she's one in that the conference. First, I think she's the first female football player. Hmm. I don't think there's been a female kicker before. Wait, wait, there, hold there, on, hold on. So there's no female American football. There's just American football. Correct. Yes. Correct. And she <laughs> plays on a team of men with yes. men? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no. that's, that's, yeah. Come on. What? Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that as a sexist terrible. thing. I'm just like, it's a high contact sport. And you just. Yes, I know. <laughs> wow. Yes, Clement, you're correct. <laughs> yeah. She's a very brave woman, I will say. Well, so I feel like we need the like the Joe Rogan Googling guy here just to, to see who's right about yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jamie. Jamie, Jamie, look yeah, us Jamie. up on his <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe one day we'll just, have someone like I don't know, Ramon, John, Peter. <laughs> Ramon, do the thing. Indy. Yes, Google it for yeah, us. So Cindy. Know it. Yes. Um, totally but fair. yeah, it so, has to be a girl, Clement. Yeah, it should be a girl. It would be a, a lot referee more. girl. It would be definitely a lot more. <laughs> Balance, <laughs> more fun to come to work. Um, but yeah, so do you, you know, public speaking, I mean, people aren't really hiring for events right now, or are they? I mean, how how is this adjusted to online in your experience? So what a lot of people don't understand right now is this is actually the best time to get into public speaking, probably oh. in, in the history of public speaking. And wow. the reason for that is because in the past, you know, to get a public speaking gig, you had to um, fly there in person, you know, park at a hotel, stay the night, get up early the next morning, have breakfast, get, uh, give your speech, and then get back on your flight and go home. And even like the top busiest public speakers in the world, you know, they're lucky if they can give 50 to 60, maybe, maybe 100 uh, presentations per, uh, per year. 
now during this time, because pretty much everything is virtual, you could definitely give a hundred presentations in a month if you wanted to, <laughs> um, yeah. because there's no travel, there's no, um, not that extra buffer time as you can just hop on your computer, give a presentation. And what a lot of people are taking advantage of is recognizing that if you have a back end offer, you can still make a lot of money for your business through presentations. And that's what do you mean still- by that? Cause, cause I don't think people know what you're talking about when you say back end offer. So a back end offer. So for example, so I'm, I'm a coach and consultant. And so I charge, you know, high ticket prices for my services. And so when I give a presentation to a group of people, I give them great content. And at the end I say, Hey, and if you want to talk more about um, getting one-on-one or group coaching from me, here's how you book a consultation. And then they book a consultation with me and then I convert them as a client. And so front end offers essentially giving, getting paid, you know, thousand dollars for a presentation. Back end offer is essentially getting paid ten thousand dollars for your services that you converted from that presentation. So mm. hopefully that makes sense to the audience of front end versus back end. And um, you could talk about front end for books too, like oh I sold a thousand dollars worth of copies of my book. Back end, oh I landed you know twenty thousand dollars of consulting gigs because of my book essentially. And so I specialize in helping people get those presentations so they can grow their business on the back end and bring more profit to their company. Yeah, I see how this could be really a, an, a golden era for entrepreneurship because you have this mass exodus of jobs. Uh, the, the job market's just like sh- like really shitty right now. And then now you've got all these people who are just forced to build their own brands. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is... Um, this is a pretty good sales pitch for you this episode, uh, because now <laughs> people are going to really benefit from having you know public speaking skills, so they can do these uh, online meetings and, uh, and 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 shows, and then and then build a business that way and convert through the back end. So, yeah, interesting. Okay, so well, you know, I, I think probably in that case, people are pay, being paid probably, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, less per gig because it's not there's no longer a physical. Uh, requirement to it, but maybe there's just a lot more money to be made because of the availability that you have now to do all of these new like speaking gigs. Bingo. Yeah, no, uh, I, it, that's that's hundred percent true, and that people are having to get paid less for speaking gigs themselves. But if you're not getting in front of audience as much as you can, you're missing out on a lot of money and a lot of opportunity. So. Yes, you might not get paid as much in the front end, but you still need to keep getting your brand going, putting yourself out there and really making sure that people know that your brand is there. And uh, I was so I ran the BidFest, which was a conference where we teach people video branding and online courses and various aspects around YouTube. And with these uh, two guys come on, um, they were called uh, the Luis uh, Camejo Biz Bros. And it was interesting is that they're from Venezuela and they're brothers and they were both named Luis by their parents. <laughs> and so that was, that was a new concept, but they actually built a, a six figure business in the middle of Corona because wow. all they would do is make sure they're putting out content consistently uh, each week. And they had a great quote that says, if you're out of sight and you're out of mind, then you're out of business. So you better put yourself out there continuously. Hmm. Here's, here's a good question. So how do you get in front of a rare, fairly large audience or an audience that's like within your niche? Like, how do you just get in front of them? Because I mean, you have all the public speaking skills, and you take all these classes, you do Toastmasters and things like that. And then, you know, how do you get in front of an audience period? Do you have to just work with people on that? or? Yeah, so step one is definitely Shit. knowing where you want to go in the first place. Are you good, Brandon? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. 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 Yeah, Rose again. And I was like, <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> well, at least you didn't go and get a, a a roll of toilet paper and some lubricant because uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah. that would be unfortunate. The end yeah. of podcast. Okay, guys, welcome. Yeah. Back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm frozen yeah. again He's already. <laughs> yeah, thanks for not pulling uh, Jeffrey Tubin yeah. on us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or uh, or taking us to the bathroom with you and. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I just need a second. The free Willie, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What was the question? Oh, how, how to get gigs? Yes. So the first thing you want to do is definitely plan where you want to speak in the first place. You know, which organizations, groups, um, communities have your target audience, and then you want to build a relationship with your event planner or the person who's in charge of that organization or group. 
And it's just a matter of reaching out and, and saying, hey, uh, my name's Andrew. Um, I noticed that you talked to your audience, let's say about lawn mowing. Um, I discovered three new tips about ways that lawn that uh, you can do one-handed lawn mowing and be double effective, for example. I love to present to your audience about this topic. Um, what's the, how do you, what's your process for bringing on speakers to speak to your group? And they might say, oh, you have to fill out this application or talk to this person or, oh, sorry, we're not taking applications right now, um, but you can check out this group over here. And it really is just a matter of putting yourself out there and really booking those gigs to make sure that they understand how much value you provide to the audience and showing that you are an expert and you know what you're talking about and then doing that. And the reason why you have to ask in the first place, and I love this quote, I think Gary Vaynerchuk said it, is that if you never ask, the answer is always no. And so that's mm -hmm. why you got to ask to book those gigs and apply and put yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually saw a snippet of Gary on my feed recently of him re, uh, revisiting a video he did a long time ago. I think it was like maybe a year or two years ago now, where he just literally filmed himself on the phone, picking the phone up, calling random people in the, in the, in the phone book and saying, hey, I got a bunch of beer here. Do you want some kind of thing? And he was like, look, it's still the same thing. If you want to sell the first 50 units or make the first 100 bucks or whatever, you just have to call as many people as you know and ask them if they want to buy your shit because one of them is going to want to buy your shit. So I mm -hmm. think essentially, yeah, it's people, people just have to grind like through this, you know? Um, uh, and, and so there's no magic, uh, magic bullet is what we're saying. It's, it's really a question of, okay, you, now you've got the knowledge and the skills, but you just have to start grinding and being consistent with it, uh, which is where people trip up because <laughs> it's not easy uh, for a lot of people. Most people. Well, I, I would say it's simple, but not easy. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and that was one of my, my, my shower thoughts this morning. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, I uh, like to equate sales to dating and that, um, you know, if you're a guy out there and you know, you want a girlfriend, okay, good luck trying to find a girlfriend. If you're just going to sit at home and watch movies and, and play video games, like, yeah, okay, maybe you'll meet someone online in the video game space, but it's going to be a lot easier for you to actually go out there, you know, go to a local spot, walk up to someone, say hello, tell them that, Hey, I find you, well, subconsciously, you know, tell them, you know, flirt with them, tell them you find them attractive and then go on a date. And it just like with, with sales, you know, if you want to get clients, if you're a coach or consultant or you have something to offer, step one is to meet people. Step two is to tell them what you do, what you offer. And then step three is to close them. And so it's it's simple, but not easy. And whenever you want something, you got to let the world know that you that uh, you, what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. well, hold on, hold on. There, There's a lot of good looking gamer girls out there. <laughs> they're, all, they're all playing the new shit. They're attractive. They're all over YouTube and Twitch. I'm sure you could find a girlfriend that way too. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, I know it's tricky because that's like long distance uh, unless there's like a setting to like only meet gamer girls in your local area. I'm sure there's some kind of gaming <laughs> dating app. Um, there's but, groups, uh, there's discords. Yeah, any anything's possible. I'm just talking statistically, you're gonna have a higher chance meeting someone in person somewhere than trying to find your future love online through gaming. But anything's possible, yes. <laughs> I think you might be surprised <laughs> so, nowadays. Are, are you let I me mean, this is an interesting question to ask because there's a lot of different sales philosophies and approaches, and it's almost never ending. Some of them are questionable. And others are kind of like boring. So are you more of a, a Wolf of Wall Street type of salesperson? Uh, or are you kind of like more of a David Meltzer kind of guy who, well, I, I don't know if people know these people. Let's see what you think. And then we'll, we, maybe we can talk about those guys. Well, so, uh, yeah. So just for the, the audience listening. So Wolf of Wall Street, um, you, when you say that kind of salesperson, just like, you know, custom out, you know, do whatever you can to make the sale happen. And then the David Meltzer strategy is so, so I actually hosted David Meltzer as a speaker at my, at my summit in May. Uh, yes. Awesome enough. So I'm definitely a huge fan of David Meltzer and, nice. um, yeah, he's a nine figure entrepreneur for the audience members listening in. So he's an amazing guy. And I read his book connected to goodness. Um, definitely recommend, uh, the audience read that book as well. 
Um, and when, when he talked about sales, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the, the the sales portion of his book, but essentially it's just kind of more more Gary Vaynerchuk style, right? Where you just keep giving, 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 giving until they ask you for the sale or, or what would you say the difference is between those two strategies? Yeah, I think you're right. And that's basically how I see them is uh, one is a <clears throat> very direct and uh, um, well, the Wolf of Wall Street approach. When I read his book and I listened to his audio uh, on um, the straight line uh, sales method, mm -hmm. you really are kind of forcing this person down a path where you want them to go and you're going to close in on them. And you're literally removing any of the objections that they have forcibly by making them sound silly for not buying it because none of those objections make any sense because you can rebut all of them. And mm -hmm. I think there are times when, you know, it's possible that someone really does need something like a product or a service and they would really benefit from it. And you could go down that road of kind of just saying, hey, look, you're being silly about this. Money isn't really the issue here. What's really the issue here is that you just don't, you know, your wife doesn't want you to buy it or whatever. And, uh, and, and so that's the approach that he goes for. And we've probably all seen that movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. And fortunately, he's a <laughs> type of person to uh, build a business around that model. So, so that's, that's, that's the way I see it. And I guess the other, the, the other approach, which is the David approach is, and by the way, uh, you had him speak with you. And that's probably just, I could never top that. But uh, but he, he, I just, you know, messaged him on Instagram and I, I was like, hey, by the way, thank you for uh, being such a great guy. Because I have this thing that I do every day when I journal. And one of the questions is, uh, who are you going to reach out to today or do something nice for or just speak about nicely? <clears throat> so every day I have to pick someone. Um and I, and I pick people that do genuinely uh, help me, even if I can't, you just think I can't reach them. So I, I just messaged people and I messaged David and I was like, hey, th thanks, David, for being a great guy, blah, blah. He fucking replied to me. And I think it was him <laughs> because it was just, it, it just wasn't like a template. It was just like, blah, 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 you know, like spelling mistakes and shit. Yeah. And I, 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 I do, I really appreciate that. But what he did was he was like, yeah, let me know how I can help you. How can I be of service? That's his thing, right? How can I be of service? Mm -hmm. Which is why I like that approach better than the Wolf of Wall Street. But he's a salesman through and through. And make no mistake, he's going to sell you something. Because his next thing was like, well, we're doing a sales thing, a sales course. And I think, you know, uh, it would be great to have you. So do you want to come along? And that's his strategy. So he's still selling things. But he's doing it in a way which is a lot less pressuring, and he just sells to the people who want it. You truly want to look for that, and I think uh, the Wolf of Wall Street approach is not really uh, jiving with a lot of people right now. No, yeah, no, well, I, this is a I, good I, book though. There's a lot of good tools in there too, like tonality, um, and then his at least his insights into neurolinguistic programming. He went into a lot of psychology, which was really interesting. Like if you I, I got I read the book and I did the audio book and it's funny because in the audio book he's reading his own book and he's dropping the f bomb every five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> but he takes a really interesting approach. Like it didn't sound like the Wolf of Wall Street half the time. It, it sound sounded like he really dug into the psychology of what he used to do. So I feel like there are parts of that, like some aspects you could take away that would be really effective, while avoiding his, you know, prior strategies and the pressure at the same time. There's probably a really good balance there. Mm, yeah, I agree. Well, and uh, there was like a really good uh, podcast episode where um, Jordan Belfort actually brought on Grant Cardone onto Jordan Belfort's podcast. And there was like, it was a big <laughs> oh, that thing one. that you saw that one. Yeah. Just like how like Grant Cardone's strategy of sales is way different than Jordan Belfort's and Jordan Belfort's like, wait, do you even know what you're talking about, Grant? Like, what are you like? What are you, what are you saying right now? Um, and so, yeah, Jordan Belfort definitely knows what he's talking about. And so, what I would say when it comes to sales is, you know, kind of going back to the dating analogy that if you don't think that you're one of the the most qualified, you know, highly valuable person in the room talking to a girl, you know, why, why are you talking to that girl in the first place if she said if she like tries to like bring you down or like. 
um, possibly quote unquote reject you. And then you're like, oh darn, I guess uh, I'm not, I don't have any value or worth. Like that, that's the attitude you bring to sales is that if you have a product or service to offer, you should believe that it's the greatest thing ever and it's going to help someone's life. And you're super excited to um, give it to them and, and sell it to them. And if, and if they are, and if, and if they say no to it, you're like blown away that they're not going to accept what your offer or service is because you know how amazing and incredible it is. Um, and so one of my coaches right now, you know, she's, she's trying to teach me how, you know, just like, you know, someone, if someone walks into Starbucks, how many people are going to walk into Starbucks and go, eh, actually, I don't want coffee today. I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave. Like, yeah, maybe that happens like once every 10,000 people. But for the most part, if someone comes into your arena and they know that you, you have something that they want, there should be no reason why they should say no. And you should have, you know, hundred percent conversions rate based on people who are talking to you. So I, I think that's one of the most essential things in sales is knowing that you are serving them, you are helping them, you are improving their life. Um, if, if you know you are, I know there's other things you could be offering that aren't helping people, but hopefully <laughs> you're offering something that is serving someone's life and just really understanding, you know, what their objections are in advance and then knowing how to rebuttal them. And one more sales story, I follow a guy on LinkedIn, uh, Josh, Josh something, um, you know, he, he uses the analogy how... You know, when you're in math class and uh, the teacher brings out the note cards and it's like four times five is 20, uh, three times three is nine. You just go through his note cards. And when you see the note card, you know exactly what's going to happen next because um, you have that kind of preparation. So just like in sales, if you know the objections that are going to come up ahead of time, then you know exactly how to prepare for them and how to be more calm when answering them rather than freaking out if there's any kind of objection. And then mm. just knowing how to respond accordingly to make sure they get your service or offer. Hmm. Have you thought about doing like relationship coaching? Because I imagine sales and you know asking a girl out or managing. I was actually going to ask that too. Girl, <laughs> we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> Clement and I share uh, same same brain. Share so. hot for low. <laughs> what do you share, we're Brandon? We're <laughs> with each other. Um, but yeah, have you ever thought about doing some type of relationship consulting? I feel like sales and, you know, talking to girls, asking girls out, managing a relationship, there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, no, I definitely would like to build that as part of my brand at some point is helping people with relationship coaching and, uh, and dating coaching, because, um, I actually did a Facebook live recently, uh, about, about dating. And uh, I got a few shares, a lot of comments, a lot of likes saying, oh my gosh, Andrew, this it's amazing. Thank you so much. This was helpful. And, and yeah, that's, that's one of the things I talked about is just like, you know, if you, the first step of dating is really developing yourself as a person. Um, and I've talked about how, you know, through my own confidence journey. So a little bit of my journey with girls is I actually didn't hit puberty till I was 16. <laughs> and so, oh, so no. most of my life was a uh, <laughs> little Andrew walking around awkwardly saying hello in my really squeaky voice and <laughs> just getting, you know, laughed at, rejected, friend zone left and right. Um, and so I actually did read a lot of books about, you know, how to be better, more confident about talking to women and uh, not being as nervous and uncomfortable talking to opposite sex. Um, and since then, you know, I've gotten confidence how to get a girl's number I was from a waitress, from like random girls in the grocery store, um, at a coffee shop. Um, and so, I, and so, yeah, I, I definitely do want to grow that part of my brand is helping other people with relationship and dating coaching so they can have more confidence in themselves to talk to people they're attracted to hundred percent. You should totally, we should get you on my, uh, my podcast. Uh, that would be interesting to talk about like, uh, how, a knowledge of sales or, you know, how essentially you are selling yourself and all mm -hmm. big salespeople say this, that you're selling yourself all the time, mm -hmm. even if it's just to convince someone, you know, that they need to help you, you know, put some stuff away. Or if you're trying to convince someone to get in business with you or you're always selling something. So I think relationships is no different. If you're trying to attract a partner, you kind of want to you know, sell yourself a little better. So that would be an interesting episode to do. Yeah, yeah, Clement has Clement has his own standalone podcast, like I do with Blockhash. Except his is based around unleashing the love and <laughs> he talks to people about <laughs> love and relationships, <clears throat> stuff like that. Yeah, maybe you can share that with uh with Andrew at some point. He might be a good person to have on. Yeah, happy to. That'd be great. Um, 
but uh, but that's good. That's good to know. I mean, there are so so like there are loads of different philosophies. For you, what what would you say your philosophy is when it comes to sales? Like, and, and what really works for you? And and you know, I mean, to top that off, what would be the the single most powerful thing uh, anyone could do to to really be a good salesperson? I would say it goes back to know what you're offering meet people, tell them what you're offering, make the sale. That's the, that's essentially is that yeah, whenever, whenever you want to go find clients, go get those clients, like go out, go out there, go to networking meetings, make Facebook posts, um, call your family and friends and saying, Hey, do you know anyone who needs this? Do you know anyone who wants this? Um, just go out and, and, and grab it. Um, and go go get it. That's what I would say is is a bit big part of sales. That when you want something, go go get it, and don't let anything hold you back. And and just know that what you're doing, and hope, hopefully what you're offering, what you're providing, does help people, does transform lives, does improve someone's life in some capacity. And there should be no reason why they wouldn't want it. So okay, Andrew. So you've you've told me before and on the podcast that you know it would be like a dream, and it'd be like the ideal lifestyle specifically for you if you could go and do a speaking gig um then walk out 60 minutes later with a big fat check that would be freaking awesome um hell i'd love mm -hmm. to do that too but yeah what would you want to speak about or do you not care and you could speak on whatever they'd want you to speak about like is do you have like a dream ideal speaking gig where you speak about something in particular because i haven't i'm not sure like what you know, drives Andrew to speak? Like what? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'd say one of my most recent revelations in the past two years is the importance of accountability. And, and for those listening in, uh, Brandon has joined uh, several of my accountability programs. And so far, they've had 100% guaranteed success rates. And which is just incredible for any program. Um, and the, the way it works is essentially, People are sometimes afraid to bet on themselves where they actually put money down and saying, hey, I'm going to do this. And if I don't, you get to keep my money because a lot of people say, oh, I want to publish a book. Oh, I want to run a marathon. Oh, I want to be a, a traveling speaker. Like, oh, I want to start my own business. They say they want to do all these things, but they're not willing to actually bet on themselves or put money behind it. And just most recently in the most recent accountability program I did with um, Brandon, as I helped four people, including myself, make $10,000 in 30 days or less. And so once I discovered this power of accountability, that's definitely something I, I want to talk about in a TEDx talk is how accountability really can change lives. And if you accomplish a goal fast enough, time moves slower and that gives you more time to do other things. And I feel like this is just a huge revelation for me that I wish other people had known more about is just if you really want something, put some accountability behind it and you can really have anything you want. Yeah, I've been playing around with that too. I think I I I first started to oh, I first started to mess around with that and I think I told Brandon this too because Brandon and I have a like a small little accountability thing going on. It's not something that they put we put money behind, but that's an interesting idea. So it's got me thinking. We should. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to think maybe I should now. I think that's one Let's of the key ingredients. Each other. <laughs> <laughs> Bet against each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I used to have a, a little accountability group with Lewis Howes back in the day. Just mm. me and him would go. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's pretty big online. And he he it wasn't him that introduced me to the idea, but we were we were around people that were doing this as well. And so I think in the high performance groups around the world, this is a really important part of life is you got to say what you got to do what you're saying you're going to do. Basically, if you want to achieve X, Y, and Z, you better bloody do it. Because if you're not, you're not going to achieve, you're not going to be a high performance person. And what, what, what reason do you have being in this group kind of thing? So there's kind of like a pressure. I think it's a pressure, isn't it? Applied on people, but for good reason. Um, and without that, you know, you're, you're kind of almost a slave to your own uh distractions and vices and things and people struggle with that so much i think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of books out at the moment that are talking about habits how to rewire yourself how to get you know rewire your habits and 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 get rid of the bad ones and and make new good ones and it's the science and all of this stuff so 
Um, yeah, you're you're definitely onto something. I'm on a rant right now, so I'm kind of like taking the <laughs> mic and I'm running away with it. <laughs> Clement, come back. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I 100% agree, of course. And because another perspective that I love too is that whenever someone wants a goal for themselves, like financially, like let's say you know you're making you know two thousand or three thousand or four thousand a month, and you want to be making ten thousand a month. Every month that you're not making that ten thousand dollars, you're missing out on that eight, seven, six thousand dollars. And so once people start to recognize that, that you know the fear of loss is worse than the desire for gain, that's when they can hopefully understand how important it is to recognize what they're missing out on by not getting what they want. Yes, yes. Um, I think there's a lot of real nuggets of wisdom in this conversation with you that if people you know make some notes, uh, and they and they they start moving in the direction of a lot of these kinds of pieces of uh, advice that we've given, um, whether it's journaling uh, on a daily basis, being accountable to your actions or your uh, at least your wishes, uh, the kind of approach you use for sales, how you speak and act in public, and you know I think there's so much in this conversation already that is just going to transform lives if people apply it. Oh yeah, and some good snippets too. Yeah, man. <laughs> All about it. Snippet, snippet friendly, this show. You know, <laughs> you know what you could do, Andrew, friendly. like with your 30-day programs, another thing you could do is take it to like uh, some large companies, some big SMEs, and you could try to apply it to the workplace there and get an employer to get their employees to do it to create more community or efficiency in the workplace. That'd be an interesting yeah. angle. Like, yeah, no, I know people like the competition and they, they like... Uh, they like progress. So yeah, I feel something I want to do at some point is take it to a corporate level. Are you going to do another one? Yes. Yeah. I see the plan. The next one, I believe will be starting in February. Um, and so for 2021, I'm putting together a mastermind where I'm going to help at least 30 people create a six figure business. And we're going to produce them a book, a podcast, a speaking platform and or online course. And so I'm going to helping 30 people create six figure businesses in 2021 and help them build that personal brand that become the influencer they've always wanted to be. So that's one of my big 2021 goals is helping transform the lives of 30 plus people. Wow. I just remember the book, Andrew, I forgot to ask you about that. So can you tell us what the book's going to be? Like, do you know yet? Or have you started writing anything? Uh, my most recent book is going to be about uh, right now I'm, Think about making around uh, webinars um, because that's something I specialize in helping people create their own audience for webinars. And so I'm mm -hmm. still working on that. And then, yeah, I still need to create my accountability book. So, um, yeah, the books are still still pending and going to be coming out soon. Nice. That's Please. cool. Yeah, I think everyone should play with writing a book at some point in their life. I think it, if anything, it probably teaches you more about yourself than it does <laughs> the people reading it. So, um uh, I I also would like to do that, but you are in the process of doing it, and that's going to be your that's going to be coming out next year, or at least you, you're going to aim to get it uh, accepted by a publisher next year. Yeah, so I'm going to be self publishing it, and I'm also working with another um, publishing company called Jones Jones Media Publishing, um, and so they're going to help me publish it and self publish it, and yeah, it should be. I don't have a set date for 2021 yet, but um, I'll, I'll probably be in the springtime, if anything. Yeah. Right, right. You know, I thinking I or right already. I'm thinking I could do two birds with one stone. Uh, I could do a book published by me that contains <laughs> the most pictures of someone's butt in history, <laughs> and and it could get a new Guinness World Record at the same time. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no. I could see you getting really creative with that, laying in front of the fireplace, butt photo, going to the bathroom, <laughs> butt photo, on, on the top option. of the house. <laughs> one option. Yeah, but I'm, but uh, yeah, Andrew, it, it it I think you know this would be a good uh, point to kind of taper it off and uh, close up the episode. But you, you've uh, been honestly one of our best guests. We had some really good nuggets of wisdom from you, and I'm going to hold you to it. Uh, get you on my uh, podcast, talk about relationships as well. That would be Love good. Love to. 
No, thank you for the compliment. Happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Andrew, yeah, I do appreciate you coming on and everything. So I think you do offer some really good wisdom, especially in, um, you know, public speaking and stuff like this and sales, because you're, you're doing well with that right now. And you definitely get me on every time and get me hooked. So anyone that can do that, I ha highly recommend. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. Brandon's a tough nut to crack, but <laughs> thank you. That's not what <laughs> she said. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she said that nut cracked quickly. No. <laughs>